Good afternoon and thank you for joining us live for Governor Wolf's latest Facebook Town Hall. Today's discussion will focus on climate change, energy and the environment and because of that the governor is joined by Secretary of the Department of Environmental Protection John Quigley and Secretary of the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Cindy Dunn. They'll begin answering your questions in just a moment but first Governor Wolf would like to say a few words about his administration's commitment to the environment and Pennsylvania's natural resources. Governor Wolf, thanks for being here today. Thank Thanks for having me, Megan and, and John and Cindy. Thanks for being here. It's Happy. good to have you here. Um, so let me just start off by saying today we're announcing a new way forward that protects our environment. It reduces climate change and helps businesses by reducing the waste of a valuable product. Methane, the primary component of natural gas, has been identified by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency as the second most prevalent greenhouse gas emitted in the United States from human activities. It actually has more than 25 times the warming power of carbon dioxide. Secretary Quigley and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection have developed a cost-effective strategy to reduce methane emissions from the oil and natural gas industry. These best-in-class measures that Pennsylvania will require are already used by industry-leading companies required by federal regulations or they're mandated by other states. The best companies understand the business case for reducing methane leaks. Methane that doesn't leak into the atmosphere can be used for energy production. DEP will develop and implement four emission reduction measures to focus on both gas production and transmission requiring efficiency upgrades for equipment, implementation of best practices, and more frequent use of leak sensing technologies. The changes in regulations and permitting are designed to improve product delivery efficiency and streamline permitting. The costs of these requirements will be a fraction of a percent of the industry revenues in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the second largest producer of natural gas in the nation, behind Texas, right? And we're uniquely positioned to be a national leader in addressing climate change while supporting and ensuring responsible energy development, creating new jobs, and protecting public health and our environment. These regulations will improve our air, address the urgent crisis of climate change, and help businesses reclaim product that is now wasted. It's a win-win for everyone. So, back to you, Megan. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Uh, we'd like to take a minute before we start answering your questions that you've submitted to Governor Wolf on Facebook to just speak really quickly with Secretary Quigley and Secretary Dunn about some of the things that your agencies have done over the last year uh, to promote Governor Wolf's agenda when it comes to energy and the environment. Well, it's, it's been a very busy year. It's hard to believe it's already a year, but the time flies when you're having fun. Uh, we've done a lot, I think, to move the ball forward to meet our mission as an agency, protecting Pennsylvania's air, land, water, and public health. Uh, on the air side, we've advanced the regulation to reduce, substantially reduce uh, nitrous oxide pollution, smog pollution in Pennsylvania. We actually negotiated a permit condition with uh, South Central Pennsylvania's largest emitter of NOx pollution to cut their pollution in half. Uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, we took big steps to clean up uh, Pennsylvania's uh, water, uh, which is really essential to life, obviously. Uh, this week we'll be announcing the work that we have completed, uh, a new plan to reboot our efforts to clean up the Chesapeake Bay and local water quality in Pennsylvania. We're advancing a very significant regulation package on natural gas development in Pennsylvania to regulate surface activities. Uh, that will be finalized this spring. Uh, we have done a lot of great work on climate. We released a climate impacts assessment report prepared by scientists at Penn State University. And we're advancing, Governor, at, at your direction, uh, a clean power plan that works for Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been committed to science. We did a, a groundbreaking scientific study of the Susquehanna River and the loss of the smallmouth bass population in the river. With my friend Secretary Dunn, uh, we've created a seismic monitoring network in Pennsylvania to make sure that we're paying attention to that important activity. And we We've been committed to transparency. We launched an e-comment portal where citizens can participate very easily with a click in the regulatory process. We convened a 14-city listening tour on the Clean Power Plan. So we have been committed to transparency and public participation in all of this work. Okay. Well, I'm happy to report that we had a spectacular year in Pennsylvania's 121 state parks across the state. We had 38 million visitors at uh, feeds 13,000 local jobs and adds 1.2 billion to our economy. But we uh, were helped, in fact, by the spectacular weather that happened throughout the summer and fall. So I have to owe that a little bit to the weather. Um, our focus on our state forests, when I uh, spoke to the governor before coming on as secretary, he asked me a lot of questions about Pennsylvania's forests and the jobs they support. Uh, our 2.2 million acres of state forest land uh, contributes to a huge part of Pennsylvania's economy. 
uh, 60,000 important jobs across the state. And that's lower than it should be, frankly, even though it sounds like a lot. It has $19 billion to our economy. And um, we thought this is uh, too, too serious to keep the questions right in Harrisburg. So we launched, uh, the governor launched a Green Ribbon Task Force, including uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, academic institutions as well as the business sectors to understand how we can get more jobs in Pennsylvania from our wonderful Pennsylvania hardwoods that we're surrounded with here, here today at this uh, meeting. We took to heart the governor's call for greater transparency. We sought um, opinions and uh, input to our state recreation plan, which will really guide recreation across the state for the next five years. 10,000 people responded. Um, what they asked for uh, is recreational attributes that contribute to good health. So I've been meeting with the health secretary and how to add to that. So we want to put a trail within 15 minutes of every Pennsylvanian. So people come home from work, you know, get, roll out of the garage on a bike and get to a trail and increase their health and uh, decrease obesity. So we've been uh, focused on that um, as well. Our part with climate, we feel we can add a lot to uh, habitat resilient, climate resiliency by protecting and conserving land, conserving forests on mountaintops. Pennsylvania is, a, you know, Penn's Woods. Pennsylvania means Penn's Woods. There's one tree in Pennsylvania for every human on earth. Uh, and so if we, the more trees you increase, the more carbon's tied up, the more shading of streams, shading of city streets, enhancing uh, quality of life. So, so trees are part of the answer for climate change and certainly large habitat resiliency. So we were able to add 25,000 acres to our 2.2 million acre forest system in the Commonwealth. And that's land that will be conserved both for forest and for forest products. It's a uh, working forest land that we were able to conserve. So we've uh, had a bu busy and productive year and uh, very happy, I might add. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. All right, let's get to our Facebook questions. We really appreciate all the questions uh, that you've submitted for Governor Wolf, and we'll get to just as many of them as we can in our limited time. We're going to start on the topic of methane. Uh, Carol from Harleysville says, I applaud the DEP for continuing its work on updated regulations for the oil and gas industry. It is long overdue, but these proposed rules aren't addressing drilling pollution in the air like methane emissions and leaks. Is your administration taking action on that? When and how? Actually, we are taking action on methane, and I'll <coughs> let the secretary talk a little bit more about this, but I think we start in February uh, right. with uh, methane emission uh, uh, regulations, and, and uh, they really, it, it's something that, Carol's right, it's, this is something that's really important. It's important to the industry. We waste a lot of methane gas uh, that, that gets, escapes into the air, I think, what, 5 million MCF, 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, at at a dollar sixty a thousand cubic feet, that's eight million dollars of just waste, and we can save at least forty percent of that over the next fifth, five years, uh, with a minimal amount of uh, of investment. So, John, why don't you talk a little bit about what we're doing? Sure, Governor. And again, at your direction, we started working on this methane challenge uh, day one of the administration, and we are poised now uh, to deliver to our air quality technical advisory committee in early February this a combination of revised general permits and regulatory concepts that we will then push through the regulatory process. So we're looking really at the second half of this year of having new general permits in place, which will give the industry streamlined permitting in exchange for enhanced environmental protections and, and specifically reduced methane emissions, reduced volatile organic compound emissions. And, and then over the course of the next, say, year or 18 months, we will complete the regulatory language to apply those new standards to existing sources. So the goal here is to cover not only new sources of methane and VOC emissions, but also existing sources over time. We want to have a comprehensive program. I think it's, it's nation leading. I think it's the strongest set of provisions in the country. And I think the number two natural gas producing state in the nation should have the best regulations, and that's what we're going to have in Pennsylvania. Thanks. We're going to go on to the next one from the PA Coal Alliance. And they ask, why is Pennsylvania rushing early compliance with the EPA's most recent and costly regulation, the Clean Power Plan? Let, let me just start, I'll turn it over to you guys, but uh, we're not rushing anything. I think 2016 uh, is the, we're, we, we want to get our report in on time, we don't want to do it late. Um, and we, we're really uh, ad addressing, I think, a, a problem that, yes, it has come out of Washington, uh, but this is something that's reflected in the price of coal worldwide and, and the re reduction in demand, market demand worldwide. Um, and we want to be there with uh, our own uh, plan, which actually 
many members of the industry are applauding. Uh, they want us to get in uh, this plan early so that they have some uh, predictability. Uh, uh, but uh, John, anything you want to? Yes, yes, Governor. Uh, again, at your direction, uh, our challenge is a little bit higher than, than most states. Not only do we want to meet the Clean Power Plan requirements of reducing Pennsylvania's emissions by 32% by 2030, but uh, as you have uh, asked us, we want to maintain Pennsylvania's role as the leading energy exporting state in the nation and maintain a role for every indigenous energy source in Pennsylvania, including coal. So there is a future for coal in Pennsylvania's Clean Power Plan. And we have been asked by the regulated community, by Pennsylvania's electricity industry, to submit a final plan in September of this year because they want predictability, as you said. They want business certainty. They want to know what the rules of the road are going to be as soon as they can so that they can have a longer planning horizon. So submitting a plan in September this year uh, not only protects Pennsylvania's environment, makes a bold statement with respect to our role in reducing the impacts of climate change, preserving the state's energy economy, but it's also responding directly to the, the needs of the business community. Our next question. I, let me just, yeah. uh, I think John made a really important point. We want coal to have to play an important role in the, the future, the energy future for the world. We want to help that industry. It's a big industry in Pennsylvania. Absolutely, and let's talk about renewables because uh, Tom asks, I, he, he says, I am a native of Pennsylvania now living out of state. I run a fast growing renewable energy company. We have some of our operations in Western PA. We'd like to invest more in PA, particularly in solar, but the policies are lagging behind New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and other states that are eager for the jobs. Will you improve solar for Pennsylvanians with things like community solar, better SREC carve outs, and other pro solar policies? Yes, we will do a better job. I think Pennsylvania was a leader for a time. I think we've drifted back, and I think he's right that, that some surrounding states have, have eclipsed us, but we're going to, uh, our goal is to once again become a, a front runner in alternative energy sources. So, um, either of you want to weigh in on that? Well, certainly, Governor, your first budget proposal created a $225 million energy initiative uh, that would have incentivized solar and wind power and, and energy efficiency in the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, uh, didn't have the votes in the General Assembly, which is something that I think every listener here today can help with. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, in, in the context of our clean power plan, not only will we, by September of this year, have a plan for Pennsylvania that is within the four squares of the clean power plan, we will have a companion document of the should do's and it will include a lot of provisions to incentivize uh, and spur the growth of renewable energy and energy efficiency in Pennsylvania that can be done in addition to the clean power plan. So uh, we are uh, all over the, the subject of growing Pennsylvania's clean energy economy. There's a tremendous potential for jobs and economic growth for the Commonwealth and we can be a leader. And one thing we'd like to do at DCNR is really model this. We, you know, it surprises people to learn that we have 4,000 buildings on state parks and state forest land, and we'd like to model this behavior by putting solar panels on roofs as we replace them, by demonstrating to the public the, uh, the solar, what solar energy can do, what uh, energy cost savings can result from that. So we're, we're committed to our new buildings being LEED certified or LEED certifiable and demonstrating this to the public, telling the public the story through the school groups who reach the teachers and the public that visits our state parks and forests. I think the message is this is not just about the environment, this is about jobs. This is about our economy and economic growth and, and there is a real opportunity for Pennsylvania, a real opportunity for new jobs uh, in this industry and we want to do what we can to support it. Mm -hmm. Talk about uh, natural gas drilling for a second. This question comes from the Marcellus Shale Coalition, and they say, thanks to greater use and production of natural gas, America has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions more than any other country. With natural gas's uh, clear air quality benefits, shouldn't it play a larger role in your climate change action plan? Yeah, we haven't actually written the climate change action plan yet, uh, and we, uh, I'm a, uh, possibly they're talking about the clean power plan. And maybe we want to talk a little bit about, about that. But um, absolutely, I think if we deal with the methane escaping uh, from transmission and production sites, uh, the, the burning for energy of, of methane gas, of gas, is a, uh, is a clean source. But mm -hmm. we still have work to do, and, and those reports will be coming out uh, sometime this year. Well, the Climate Change Action Plan will be coming out this spring, and obviously the Clean Power Plan in September of, of this year. But I, I think a couple of points need to be made when, when you talk about natural gas and, and its climate benefits. Clearly, there are huge climate benefits to burning natural gas for electricity production. It has enabled the Commonwealth in significant measure uh, to reducing, uh, it's enabled us to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions 20 percent 
since 2007, just because of the switch from coal to gas. Uh, we need to do more. We have incentives for fleet conversion. We have the Alternative Fuel Incentive Grant Program, for example. And as we go forward, uh, we're not only facilitating the, the development of additional uh, gas-fired power plants around the Commonwealth with your Pipeline Infrastructure Task Force, uh, we're also looking at and having a really deep conversation uh, with the Marcel Shale Coalition about what else can we do? Can we use natural gas to create microgrids mm -hmm. uh, and, and thereby not only consuming more natural gas, homegrown, home-fueled, home-drilled natural gas, uh, but also build the renewable energy economy at the same time. We think there's big opportunities to improve the resiliency of the electricity grid by using microgrids. And we're in, at the start of a conversation with the Marcelo Shale Coalition, and we want to bring in academia and other experts to have a real conversation about how do we plan a more resilient grid and take advantage of the attributes of natural gas, which really is the perfect complement to renewable energy. And we have a lot of it in Pennsylvania. We certainly do. Yeah. Cindy? Yeah. I don't, I don't really have much to add. Okay. That, yeah. Well, I do have one for you, Secretary. Uh, okay. We'll How start good. with Governor Wolf, though. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, this is from Diane, our Facebook user, and she mm -hmm. says, Governor Wolf, first of all, thank you for soliciting our concerns. And, and hers is more of a comment, but she says, my request, issue no more gas leases in our state forests. They are uh, a resource to be protected and preserved for generations to come. Response to that? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, th I think was it within a week of my yeah. inauguration, I actually said we're not going to uh, do any more leases on state lands, forests, or parks right. for drilling. So I agree, and we are trying to keep those parks and forests uh, uh, as free as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Cindy, mm -hmm. you want to? Sure. And, and the reality is a lot any of any other the nice things to say. Yeah. About <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that comment. Well, the, the more term and additional leasing has, has really helped. Number one, we, we don't own the mineral rights under all the state parks and forests, uh, and in fact, some of it's already been leased. So what we're talking about is no additional leases on uh, state parks and forest land. And this is uh, important. One thing to think about, um, our state lands belong to all the people, and not just the people today, but generations yet to come. And if you think of uh, past Governor Pinchot's uh, comments, who was the first U.S. Forest Service uh, forester, the greatest good uh, for the most people for the longest time. And, and so preserving some of these other aspects of forest, including a forest product industry, is really important. So this gives DCNR a chance to regroup. Frankly, the gas rush really hit the agency uh, hard and fast uh, from 08 on. And this gives us a pause to really uh, ensure the best management of the leases we have. I think that there's an impetus on the state lands to do it the best and demonstrate the best practices. And I'm happy to say the gas companies that we do have on or on the state lands are happy to do that. They're really advancing the practice of uh, best management practices on state lands. It gives us a chance to focus on our original industry, the forest product industry, and really up our game in uh, forest management. And uh, that's critical to Pennsylvania jobs. Like I mentioned before, you know, 60,000 jobs depend on the forest industry. And that's not even counting the recreation and tourism sector that comes to Pennsylvania, you know, from places like New Jersey and Maryland and the crowded places to be in our wonderful, beautiful state force. So, um, and it gives us a chance to really hone our practices uh, and really preserve watersheds in, in the best places. So I think this is really well supported. The you know, public opinion polling supported that uh, before the governor was elected and he moved very quickly on the moratorium and it's, it's been really helpful. We also, um, again, in the effort of transparency, we've really opened up um, our state forest resource management plan for public comment. So far, we've received 4,000 comments in our state forest resource management plan and uh, folks who are uh, listening today, we've got about 10 more days to comment. So get on our webpage and uh, even if all your comment is you enjoy forests and like to hike there or if you enjoy them for something else, you know, get on and comment and uh, we'd like to hear from people. All right, let's go on to severance tax. We have Jim from Enola that says, Governor, what can Pennsylvanians do to convince their legislators to consider enacting a severance tax on oil and gas extraction? Well, uh, I, I called for a severance tax in my first budget. I still believe that, that Pennsylvania needs a severance tax. Uh, we're the only, I think, major gas producing state in the United States without one. Uh, so we do have a democracy. Uh, you need to write to your legislators and ask them to urge them to support me in, in imposing this uh, severance tax on gas that lies beneath our feet. 
secretaries? Yeah. Well, it, as the governor said, we are the, the, the only major gas producing state with a number two gas producing state, and we're the only natural gas producing state in the nation without the severance tax. It's high time uh, that we have one. It's that what the governor has proposed is reasonable. Certainly the investments that he wants to make with the proceeds are what Pennsylvania needs. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity here to take advantage of this rich natural resource, and all Pennsylvanians need to be able to benefit from it. And applying the Pinchot uh, thinking to it, so the greatest good for the most people for the longest time. So, so gas removed from the ground in Pennsylvania is, is, is something that will be gone for future generations to use. So you want to invest it in our future, and there's no better way to invest in our future than to invest it in education. So the way I look at it is take something that's future looking and invest it in our future, and I think it just makes philosophical sense to do it. It also gives all Pennsylvanians a stake in the success of this industry. Yeah. That's true. Uh, Kathy on Facebook says, uh, would you bring back solar tax breaks or credits, perhaps solar assistant loans to low-income people? Some states are penalizing solar power users because power companies don't want it to affect their profits. Would you keep the market open? No, I think, I think we've talked about this. One of the things that we need to do is, is encourage uh, people to buy uh, photovoltaic cells, solar cells. Uh, and we need to, by doing that, that encourages manufacturers to continue to make their product more, more efficient. Tax credits have worked in the past. They work in other states. Uh, uh, and uh, they worked in the past here in Pennsylvania. So, you know, we need to get back to that. Mm -hmm. and, and the other essential ingredient there, Governor, as you well know, is that we need a General Assembly that's supportive of those policies. We need to bring renewable energy in this country to scale. And the only way we can advance that as quickly as possible is with the right mix of policies and legislation. And you certainly have uh, put your cards on the table with your first budget and the $225 million energy package. Uh, and we have to get the, the kind of culture here in Harrisburg that is as supportive of the renewable energy industry as you are. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, what we're trying to do is this is good for the environment, but it's also this is would also be great for employment for our economy. Mm -hmm. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. The, the green economy, especially solar jobs, are among the fastest growing sectors of any industry in the country. I mean, think about that. It's a job that won't be outsourced. You know, solar installers are going to have jobs in Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a great trade to know. And I know our staff that uh, work on it really, really enjoy it. And it's a skill that uh, they can take anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase the next question. It comes from Karen from Burke's Gas Truth. Uh, she posted uh, several questions about climate change and natural gas policies. And specifically, Karen wants to know your views on your pipeline task force and natural gas production as it relates to climate change. Yeah, climate change is real. We need to take it seriously. Uh, if, if we're not careful, within a few decades, Pittsburgh will have the climate of, a, I guess, Washington, D.C. and uh, Philadelphia of, of Richmond, Virginia. So the, we, we need to act on, on this, uh, and, and I do take it very seriously, and I know you do too. So we're doing some good things, I think. Well, and, and again, natural gas is one of the most important reasons why Pennsylvania's greenhouse gas emissions has fallen 20% since 2007. Uh, natural gas burns 50% cleaner than coal when it's used to fire uh, electricity production. Uh, we need to take advantage of that opportunity. Also, methane-fired electric power is the perfect complement to renewable energy. Renewable energy is variable. The sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you need a baseload source of generation that can ramp up and down quickly. Natural gas-fired power is that source of energy. It's much more flexible than coal-fired power. Now, the other piece of, of a, a real energy, uh, renewable energy policy is battery technology, and we want to advance the, the development of battery technology in Pennsylvania. There's at least two companies in Pittsburgh that are working to create these next generation of batteries. Uh, so there's a tremendous job potential here, but we've got to take advantage of the attributes of natural gas to propel the renewable energy economy, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, I agree. Um, Jason from Likens says the governor of New York State has banned fracking. As governor, would you be willing to do the same to save our state from the effects of fracking natural gas drilling? No, I wouldn't. I, I don't believe in banning uh, the extraction of natural gas. I think natural gas, again, we are the second biggest state in terms of natural gas production after Texas. Uh, and it, it could be a game changer for our economy, a source of great new jobs. 
uh, and great earnings for many of our businesses, a magnet for companies who want to be uh, near the source of, of, of energy. So uh, I, I want to make this uh, industry work, but I also am concerned about the environment, and I, and I, and I share the concern that I think you know, we have with the, this, this uh, uh, question. We, we have to get it right, but I believe we can do both. I believe we can have the industry, and I believe we can do the, the regulation uh, properly so that, that uh, we have both a clean environment and a good industry. Is that? Obviously, and I think you're just going back to the, the governor's more term in the, in the state parks and forest land. I think there, there was a strong public interest in that, and he, he really responded to that. And so I think that, that, that you know, gives people a place where there won't be additional uh, gas drilling. And, he, and he, frankly, when he works with uh, secretaries like us, he really asks us for the truth and really asks us to uh, deal with the impacts. And I think that's you know raising up the professionalism in the agencies and really uh, asking for scientific-based uh, policies and regulation is key. And, and certainly there is a role, and a, a very central role for regulation. This is all about responsible natural gas development. In order to have responsible natural gas development, you have to have strong regulations, strong oversight, strong monitoring. Governor, in your first budget you proposed 50 additional inspectors for my agency that would have been paid for by the severance tax. We obviously didn't get that, so our, our yep. ability has been hampered. <laughs> Yet, you're right, but we have to have strong regulations, that we have to have strong oversight. The, the incidents and accidents and, and episodes of pollution that we have seen in Pennsylvania coming from this industry have been from poor practices and human error and, and simple accidents. We think we can reduce that error rate, and the error rate is actually trending down. But even one is, is troublesome. So it, it's our job, and it's, it's a thankless job sometimes, is to make sure that Pennsylvania has regulations that are stringent enough to meet our responsibility to make sure that this, the gas industry is doing the right thing. It's all about raising the level of performance of this industry to that of the best actors. We've got to raise the bar for everybody, and that's really what we're trying to do with all of our regulatory work. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, next one comes from Facebook user Bob Smith. Uh, no, no real question here. He simply says, climate change is a myth. In the summer it gets hot, and in the winter it gets cold. Nothing new here. Well, it's been a warm winter here, but. Well, again, again, <laughs> it, climate change is not a myth. I think there's enough science to, to show that, that things are changing, uh, and, and that, that human beings have an impact on that. Again, methane emissions are a big source of, of climate change, and so we need to, to address that with our eyes open and, and honestly, using facts and science to, to address the, the issue. Again. Uh, we need to, to make sure that, that we are uh, uh, exploiting our natural gas resource, but we need to do it wisely from an environmental point of view, and I think we're doing that. Yeah. You know, we have a lot to lose in Pennsylvania. Our uh, state tree, the hemlock, is being threatened by hemlock woolly adults whose spread is aided by uh, climate change. And uh, we, we see changes in the landscape level, warming of our streams. We see changes in the forest composition. So. It really, uh, it really makes sense to get ahead of this. So I think the good news is, I mean, people are intimidated, intimidated by the issue. It seems like a big issue, but there are steps people can take close to home. There are things. I mean, planting trees along streams, cool streams, and reduces pollution into the streams. Planting trees in your yard, shading your house, reduces your energy bills and reduces your demand on electricity. All kinds of things. Uh, people can do about it. So it, yes, it's daunting and yes, it's important, but um, there's so many other benefits to the things you can do for climate change. Changing out your light bulbs to LEDs saves money and uh, reduces your impact on carbon. So uh, I guess the thing I'd urge people is don't mistake fear and intimidation by the size of the issue for not believing it, choosing not to believe it because it's scary. Well, it is scary, but you know we can take some important steps right now and, uh, and we are, both at the policy level, um, and at the personal level. And I'll just say, Governor, that, and you may not, might not know this, although you probably do, that the first president of the United States to talk about climate change was Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Wow. So th this, has been, this has been, the science has been known for a lot longer than that, actually, but it's been a matter of public record and public policy record in this country for well over half a century. Uh, we commissioned scientists at Penn State University last year to do a climate impacts assessment update. And what those scientists at Penn State, using the best science, the best data, what they found is that Pennsylvania over the last century has warmed about two degrees Fahrenheit, but much more troubling, and that in itself is significant, but much more troublingly, we are on pace between the year 2000 and 2050 
for f over five degrees of warming, five degrees Fahrenheit of warming. And as you said, that makes uh, Philadelphia feel like present day Richmond, Virginia, mm. and Pittsburgh feel like present day Washington, D.C. They are profound changes uh, to our environment that, has, that have implications for our economy, uh, for public health, the, the prevalence of tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. Tropical diseases are found in every county in Pennsylvania. That is unheard of. Pennsylvanians are at risk from tropical diseases caused by climate change, period. Uh, the, the resilience of our electricity infrastructure is threatened by more frequent and severe storms. Local water quality, local drinking water is threatened mm -hmm. by this, the punctuation of our lives by these more frequent and severe storms. We're going to have wetter winters. That means more runoff, more pollution flowing into places like the Chesapeake Bay and, and, and the Susquehanna River. Uh, there are implications across the board that really impact every single Pennsylvanian. We have a responsibility, as Cindy said, to future generations to get this right. And I'm confident that uh, certainly in the next three years we will put in place the kinds of policies that we need to grow our economy and reduce our climate emissions at the same time. Kind of an easy last question. Uh, Mark says, what can I do to support strong policies around climate action here in Pennsylvania? So what can Mark do? Well, I think the first thing is we, we, we actually listen to, to our fellow citizens in Pennsylvania uh, and uh, weigh in, come to testify, give us your opinion as to what you think we should be doing as a, as a commonwealth. And then we put these proposals together and, and give them to the legislature. Uh, put pressure on legislators, call them, uh, contact them, ask them to, to, be, to cooperate in, in our efforts to uh, make sure Pennsylvania is doing everything it can, everything we all can, uh, to address the climate change uh, issues. Anything else we can? People are often part of organizations. You know, it, it's, uh, there, there are churches and uh, the community of faith get involved in, in climate issues. We've got yeah, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. You get on a web page and look at any Fortune 500 company. They have a sustainability plan. They've got climate initiatives. You know, I think it's, it's really time for all of us in the circles of influence we have uh, to, get, to get active and involved in, 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 with the climate issue, whatever the focus um, happens to be. And then, you know, encourage your friends to call their legislators, too. I think the legislature uh, needs to hear this message, needs to know that Pennsylvanians care and, and want to do something. Good point. And I would say certainly participate in the process. We have tried to make it easier uh, to participate in the regulatory process. We have an e-comment system where citizens can just go online and submit comments on any regulatory proposal. Uh, we believe very strongly in public participation. We did 14 listening sessions around the state uh, as we prepared to write the Clean Power Plan, Power Plan for Pennsylvania. We've done two dozen public hearings uh, with respect to our Chapter 78 rules on natural gas, which certainly is going to impact climate. So folks have opportunity that they need to take advantage of to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. and, and most fundamentally, every, every single one of us as citizens has the responsibility to vote. If you're not registered, get registered. Secretary Cortez made it a lot easier online last year for voter online registration. registration. That's right. Register right. and vote and, and be an active, engaged citizen. Great. Just for our Facebook users who may have tuned in halfway through, we are talking today on an energy and environmental roundtable with Governor Wolf, and we're joined by uh, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources Secretary mm -hmm. Cindy Dunn and Department of Environmental Protection Secretary John Quigley. I, I would just like the three of you, and, and we'll start with you, Secretary Quigley, to just sort of, uh, you know, wrap up what we've been talking about today. Maybe look ahead to, you know, you've been here a year now under Governor Wolf's leadership. Uh, we talked about accomplishments in the beginning. Uh, why don't we look ahead? to 2016 and, and what we see for your agency moving forward? Well, I, I, the first thing I want to say certainly is that it, it's an honor to, to work for this governor, uh, mm -hmm. to be doing the work that he has challenged us to do. It, it's doubly an honor to work with the women and men of my agency who I think are among the finest public servants that you will find anywhere. These folks bring their hearts to work every single day. They believe in what they do and they do great work. So it's, it's an honor to be a, a part of my agency. Uh, looking forward, uh, I would say simply it's more of the same. We have a responsibility to protect Pennsylvania's air, land, water, and public health. And, and that is our focus every single day. So we need to advance the, the kinds of methane regulations that the governor uh, announced here this afternoon to protect our climate, protect public health. Uh, we have more work to do on water quality. We'll be talking about the Chesapeake Bay uh, later this week, and which is really about local water quality. So we need to continually look at, at our mission and respond. Uh, we need to do it transparently. We need to make sure that the public understands our work. We need to be able to explain it better. 
we need to restore the capacity of the agency. Governor, as you know, uh, over the last decade, the average Commonwealth agency lost about 6% of its workforce. DEP lost 14% in that same amount of time. Uh, our information technology budget, for example, was slashed. It was $23 million 10 years ago. Today it's $16 million, and that's not because PCs got cheaper. Uh, we need to reinvest in the capacity of my agency to do its job and to be transparent to the citizens of Pennsylvania. So we have a lot of internal work to do in the agency, restoring its capacity. We have a lot of external work to engage our stakeholders and our citizens, and we have a lot more work to do to protect Pennsylvania's air, land, water, and public health. Secretary Quigley. Secretary Dunn. I have the pleasure of leading a wonderful agency that brings great value to Pennsylvanians and visitors. And I think that as we look forward to the next year, we want to continue increasing our value to the state's economy and expressing our value to the state's economy in ways that is not currently understood. You know, in some ways, we're a goose that keeps laying golden eggs. The healthier and happier DCNR is in the land we manage for the people, then the more people come, the more people enjoy, the better the economy. So. I think we have a lot to offer. We're trying to organize our work more around landscapes and communities so that the communities in small towns of Pennsylvania that are very unique, uh, nestled in the mountains and streams and rivers of the state, and how their economy depends on the local landscape, how we make those connections and really bring that to bear for the citizens in these communities of Pennsylvania. We're looking at uh, a youth initiative at the governor's encouragement. Um, we got engaged with our youth of today, and I don't want to sound like an older person uh, griping about young people, but they spend a lot of time in front of screens, so we've got to connect them to the outdoors in a way that uh, many of us enjoyed. The great news is, uh, you know, with the tool, modern tools and a commitment to digital technology that uh, this, this administration has, we're able to connect with young people and, and connect them to the outdoors and make it part of their life. We'd like to. Um, attract more people. Uh, we have a, a workforce issue as well as uh, Secretary Quigley. We have a lot of turnover, need for a lot more jobs. We want to attract a, a greater diverse uh, young uh, workforce into our work. We're looking at the climate issue ourselves. Um, we have a draft climate plan out there about how we can use uh, landscapes and trees to, for climate resiliency. And really, if you think about in a warming climate, things go northward, they go upward. So conserving uh, ridge tops is important. Conserving land's important, and the stream, the area along the stream, the riparian, so-called streamside riparian buffer is critical, shading the stream and creating uh, pathways there too. So we're honing our work, focusing it to become uh, much more strong and resilient uh, in a changing, uh, changing uh, environment due to climate. Well, again, we're trying to build on two great strengths in Pennsylvania. One, it's, it's environment. I mean, this is one of the most beautiful places in the world. You can go a number of different places in Pennsylvania and enjoy Penn's Woods. Mm -hmm. This this is a, a, a great place, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything to value that. We're also a great place to work. This this is a place that, that has a long and hallowed economic uh, tradition of growth, of innovation. We want to push that. So we want to do both of those things, and we want to do it in a typically Pennsylvania way. We want to do it practically. I mean, I think, John, you were saying that, that some of the regulations we now have uh, that we're contemplating putting into place in February with the methane, uh, uh, if, if th these are practical in that they are industry standards, this is not something that is theoretical, it's, it's industry standard. Um, and if companies do this, we, we can actually uh, make the uh, uh, approval process go faster from 130 days down to 30 days. So we're trying to do things from a practical point of view. We're actually trying to, to look at, at science to, to do protect the environment mm -hmm. and, and build on this great economic base in, in the right way. And we want to make sure this is, this is effective, that what we do protects the environment that what we do actually uh, contributes to economic growth. Those are the things we're trying to do, and, and I think that's the message that we're all trying to, to promote uh, and, and send out to all of our fellow Pennsylvanians. Wonderful. Thank you, all three of you, Governor Wolf, Secretary Dunn, and Secretary Quigley, for joining us here today on Facebook. I know we got to a lot of questions, and I, I hope our Facebook users appreciate that, and we appreciate you engaging with us. Uh, that'll do it for us. If you'd like to connect with Governor Wolf on Facebook, you may do so, as well as Twitter, at Governor Tom Wolf, and we hope to see you and continue the conversation. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Megan.